William Shakespeare, one of the greatest authors of all time, was born in Stratford-upon-Avon, England. His actual birth date is uncertain, but most scholars believe he was born on or near April 23rd, 1564. We think he may have been educated in the King's School at Stratford because that would have been typical for a child with a father who was an alderman. What we do know is that he didn't go to university. We have a marriage record for Shakespeare to Anne Hathaway in 1585. We also have baptism records for a daughter and a set of twins. And we also know that his son, Hamnet, one of the twins, died. Shakespeare moved to London in the late 1580s. By the early 1590s, we know he's writing and we know that he's acting. By 1597, Shakespeare had authored 15 of the 37 plays attributed to him, including Romeo and Juliet, Comedy of Errors, and The Merry Wives of Windsor. People think of William Shakespeare as an artist, a playwright. He was a pretty good businessman. In 1599, he built the largest open-air amphitheater in London, the Globe Theatre. He was an entrepreneur, he knew his market, he knew how to cater to that market, he made shrewd real estate investments. Shakespeare's company, the Lord Chamberlain's Men, changed its name to the King's Men when King James became its patron in 1603. This was a mark of exceptional prestige. The different types of Shakespeare plays, they're separated into histories, comedies, tragedies, and then later on, tragic comedies. Shakespeare's phrases, the ways he used words, are so common that people often get mixed up and can't remember if they came from the Bible or from Shakespeare. My grandmother used to say, when something bad happened, that these were the slings and arrows of everyday life. She was not an educated woman, and she didn't go to Shakespeare plays. She didn't get that one from the Bible. What scholars call Shakespeare's middle period from 1595 to 1605 included such classic comedies as Midsummer Night's Dream, As You Like It, Twelfth Night, and Much Ado About Nothing. He also produced Hamlet, Othello, and Macbeth during this period. Right at the cusp where Shakespeare begins to write Lear, it tips into what we could call the later Shakespeare. And this period produces Lear, Anthony and Cleopatra, Tempest, Winter's Tale, Pericles, Cymbeline. Shakespeare wrote great stories. For example, one of the stories starts with a king who is tired, he doesn't want to govern anymore, so he says to his three daughters, I'm going to separate the kingdom between the three of you, but it's going to be based on who tells me how much they love me. However much you love me, that's how much of the kingdom you're going to get. Now that's going to make me sit up. I mean, what a way to start a story. And that's King Lear. Shakespeare was not only a playwright, he also was a poet, partly because of economic necessity. During the early 1590s, plague closed the theaters in London, and there was quite a vogue for producing sonnets. Shakespeare wrote 154 sonnets, in addition to several narrative poems. Shakespeare worked the English language, milked it for all it was worth, made up words if it didn't give him the right words. He is one of the first professional writers. The details of William Shakespeare's death remain a mystery, but scholars believe he died on his birthday, April 23rd, 1616. In the 400 years since, Shakespeare's influence has only grown. His writing is the second most quoted after the Bible. He has been credited with introducing almost 3,000 words to the English language, and a Google search on Shakespeare returns more than 140 million results. Shakespeare talked about the human condition. He explains to us how we think, how we feel, the human psyche. He eloquently explains it. In the 18th century, questions arose about the authorship of Shakespeare's work. Given the vague details we know of his life, his lack of higher education, and the similarity of his plays to others of the day. Today, most scholars believe Shakespeare wrote all his plays and sonnets. I would argue that Shakespeare's legacy is the most influential figure in human civilization.
Why do we cringe when we hear Shakespeare? If you ask me, it's usually because of his words. All those thines and thous and therefores and wherefore art thous can be more than a little annoying. But you have to wonder, why is he so popular? Why have his plays been made and remade more than any other playwright? It's because of his words. Back in the late 1500s and early 1600s, that was the best tool that a person had and there was a lot to talk about. However, most of it was pretty depressing, you know, with the Black Plague and all. Shakespeare does use a lot of words. One of his most impressive accomplishments is his use of insults. They would unify the entire audience, and no matter where you sat, you could laugh at what was going on on stage. Words, specifically dialogue in a drama setting, are used for many different reasons to set the mood of the scene, to give some more atmosphere to the setting, and to develop relationships between characters. Insults do this in a very short and sharp way. Let's first go to Hamlet. Right before this dialogue, Polonius is the father of Ophelia, who is in love with Prince Hamlet. King Claudius is trying to figure out why Prince Hamlet is acting so crazy since the king married Prince Hamlet's mother. Polonius offers to use his daughter to get information from Prince Hamlet. Then we go into Act 2, Scene 2. Polonius, do you know me, my lord? Hamlet, excellent, well, you're a fishmonger. Polonius, not I, my lord. Hamlet, then I would you were so honest a man. Now, even if you did not know what fishmonger meant, you can use some contextual clues. <laughs> 1. Polonius reacted in a negative way, so it must be bad. 2. Fish smell bad, so it must be bad. And 3. Munger just doesn't sound like a good word. So from not even knowing the meaning, you're beginning to construct some characterization of the relationship between Hamlet and Polonius, which was not good. But if you dig some more, fishmonger means a broker of some type. And in this setting would mean like a pimp, like Polonius is brokering out his daughter for money, which he is doing for the king's favor. This allows you to see that Hamlet is not as crazy as he's claiming to be and intensifies the animosity between these two characters. Want another example? Romeo and Juliet has some of the best insults of any of Shakespeare's plays. It's a play about two gangs and the star-crossed lovers that take their own lives. Well, with any fisticuffs, you know that there is some serious smack talk going on, and you are not disappointed. In Act 1, Scene 1, right from the get-go, we are shown the level of distrust and hatred the members of the two families, the Capulets and Montagues, meet. Gregory, I will frown as I pass by and let them take it as they list. Samson, nay, as they dare, I will bite my thumb at them, which is a disgrace to them if they bear it. Enter Abraham and Balthazar. Abraham, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Samson, I do bite my thumb, sir. Abraham, do you bite your thumb at us, sir? Okay, so how does this development help us understand mood or character? Well, let's break it down to the insult. Biting your thumb today may not seem like a big deal, but Samson says it is an insult to them. If they take it so, it must have been one. This begins to show us the level of animosity between even the men who work for the two houses. And you normally would not do anything to someone unless you wanted to provoke them into a fight, which is exactly what's about to happen. Looking deeper, biting your thumb in the time in which the play was written is like giving someone the finger today. A pretty strong feeling comes with that, so we now are beginning to feel the tension in the scene. Later on in the scene, Tybalt, from the house of the Capulets, lays a good one on Benvolio from the house of the Montagues. Tybalt, what, art thou drawn among these heartless hinds? Turn thee, Benvolio, and look upon thy death. Benvolio, I do but keep the peace. Put up thy sword, or manage it to part these men with me. 
Tybalt, what, drawn and talk of peace? I hate the word, as I hate hell, all Montagues and thee. Have at thee, coward. Okay, heartless hinds. Well, we know that once again, it's not a good thing. Both families hate each other, and this is just adding fuel to the fire. But just how bad is this stinger? A heartless hind is a coward, and calling someone that in front of his own men and the rival family means there's going to be a fight. Tybalt basically calls out Benvolio, and in order to keep his honour, Benvolio has to fight. This dialogue gives us a good look at the characterization between these two characters. Tybalt thinks that the Montagues are nothing but cowardly dogs and has no respect for them. Once again, adding dramatic tension to the scene. Okay, now here's a spoiler alert. Tybalt's hot-headedness and severe hatred of the Montagues is what we literature people call his harmatia, or what causes his downfall. Oh yes, he goes down at the hands of Romeo. So when you are looking at Shakespeare, stop and look at the words, because they really are trying to tell you something. Hey, welcome back. This is Comfair. I'm this is this video is going to be my 15 favorite Shakespeare quotes because I don't really have anything else to talk about right now because I'm reading King John and therefore cannot make a video of it at the moment. But I'm uh, yeah on to my favorite 15 Shakespeare quotes and I will pull them up on my phone because I have a phone and I have them on it. Methinks the lady doth protest too much. This one's from Hamlet. It's uh, for, uh, Queen Gertrude saying that she thinks that the lady in the play is actually th thinking that the thing that they think that she's thinking, but she's denying it so so much that they think she's dead. Okay, on to the next one. I do not love anything in the world so much as you. Is that not strange? This one is from Much Ado About Nothing. <laughs> it's Benedict talking to Beatrice, and I, it's the only, like, it's the only quote that I remember from Much Ado About Nothing that I really, really liked, but I really like it because it's, uh, uh, it's, it's cute. This next one is from Henry V. We few, we happy few, we band of brothers. For any man who sheds his blood with me today shall be my brother, be he ne'er so vile, this day shall gentle his condition. And gentlemen in England now abed shall think themselves accursed they were not here. Yeah, that's a, a, a bit of an emotional part in the St. Crispin speech. St. Crispin, I, I like that play a lot. Wouldst thou have thy head broken? No. Then be still. This one is from Henry IV, part one. It's between Kate Percy and Hotspur and their, their, uh... I love using this one for, uh, everyday purposes. Because if you say, wouldst thou have thy head broken to someone, they automatically go no, and so you get to finish the other end of the quote, and that's very satisfying and very, actually, very effective for, for getting people who are hyper to shut up. Thou hast displaced the mirth, and broke the good meeting with most admired disorder. <laughs> Lady Macbeth from Macbeth. It's the Banquo banquet scene, and she's like... To Macbeth, she's just like... You broke the mood by screaming at nothing. The next one is from Henry IV, part one, as well. I know you all, and will a while uphold the unyoked humor of your idleness. Yet, herein will I imitate the sun, 
who doth permit the base contagious clouds to smother up his beauty from the world, that when he pleaseth again to be himself, being wanted, he may be more wondered at by breaking through the foul and ugly mists that did seem to strangle him. I don't remember the rest of that one, but I want to learn that speech really badly so that I can just say it normally, like, out in the open, because it's a good one for getting people to shut up as well. Weary with toil, I haste me to my bed, the dear repose for limbs with travel tired, but then begins a journey in my head to work my mind when body's work's expired. That one's from a sonnet, because that's one, sonnet 116, and I, no, not sonnet 116, that's not sonnet 116, I'm sorry. That's sonnet 27, and I, I really like that sonnet, it's about insomnia, which I have. When I'm laying in bed, just like, I can't go to sleep, and then that, that sonnet begins to repeat in my head, and I'm like, oh, I feel slightly better, because Shakespeare had insomnia too. Love is not love, which alters when it alteration finds, or bends with the remover to remove. Oh no, it is an ever-fixed mark, which looks on tempests and is never shaken. It is the star to the ever-wandering bark, whose worth's unknown, although his height be taken. Love's not time's fool, though rosy lips and cheeks within his bending sickle's compass come. Love alters not with his short hours and weeks, but bears it out, even to the edge of doom. If this be error and upon me proved, I never writ, nor no man ever loved. That's also a sonnet. It's sonnet 116, which I accidentally... yeah, it's sonnet 116. Hell is empty, and all the devils are here. I am in blood, stepped in so far that to wade no more would be as tedious as go o'er. That one's really kind of complicated, out of context. <laughs> Put your shields before your hearts, and fight with hearts more proof than shields. That one's from Coriolanus, and I don't even know why I really like that one. It's kind of... I think I just like the syntax of it. It just sounds awesome. <laughs> we know what we are know not what we may be. That quote is actually on my wall. There we are. Okay, cool. You see that? You see that? Okay. Let's talk of graves, of worms and epitaphs. Make dust our paper, and with rainy eyes write sorrow on the bosom of the earth. Let us sit upon the ground and tell sad stories of the death of kings, how some have been deposed, some slain in war, some haunted by the ghosts they have deposed, some poisoned by their wives, some sleeping killed, all murdered. For within the hollow crown which rounds the mortal temples of a king keeps death his court, and there the antic sits, scoffing at his state and grinning at his pomp, allowing him a breath, a little scene to monarchize, be feared, and kill with looks. As if this flesh which walls about our life were brass impregnable, and being humored thus, comes at the last, and with a little pin, bores through our castle wall, and farewell, king. Cover not your head, and mock not flesh and blood with solemn reverence, for you have but mistook me all this while. I live with bread like you. Feel, want, taste, grief, need friends. Subjected thus, how can you say to me, I am a king? That one's from Richard II. It's what the YouTube channel is named after. <laughs> you, you got the whole speech there. Except for, I cut out a little bit of whining about Bolingbroke and, uh, listing of what things you did after a king was dead. Tomorrow, and tomorrow, and tomorrow, creeps in this petty pace from day to day until the last syllable of recorded time. And all our yesterdays have lighted fools the way to dusty death. Out, out, brief candle, Life's but a walking shadow, a poor player, 
who struts and frets his hour upon the stage and then is heard no more. Is it, it is a tale told by an idiot, full of sound and fury, signifying nothing. That one's also from Macbeth. All of the Macbeth quotes that I have given to you, except for, like, the thou hast displaced the mirth one, have been really dark, I'm sorry. <laughs> and the last one, number one, <laughs> This is something that I recently memorized because I, I really like it. But thoughts, the slave of life. And life, time's fool, and time that takes survey of all the world must have a stop. I just realized that both of the things that I just said were about life ending, which is kind of bad. I don't know. That one that I just said was from Henry the Fourth. It was Hotspur's dying speech. Anyway. That was fun. I don't know how long this video will be. I've, I've been having fun and I, the, the time goes by quicker when I'm having fun. So yeah, have a good day, have a good weekend, have a good week, have a good month, have a good year, I don't know. This has been Comfair in her insanity. Have... yeah. Ah, the tripod's falling. Okay.